How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear the pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trust in your steadfast love, and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. We say... Thanks be to God. He's touching me. He won't stop touching me. I love kids. Kids are the outward signs of the internal struggle that we all have. Because who doesn't want to not be heard? A little bit aside, this is the first coffee I've had in like four days. My wife is with uh, her parents. They were having a nice party up there. And I usually make coffee for my wife. And when she's not there, I am the worst person to take care of myself. So no, I didn't have any coffee because it wasn't there. And our lovely coffee crew has provided coffee this morning. I don't have a headache this morning. I wonder why. It is a reminder when I walked around the house that I did not have a whole lot of noise. Some of you remember that noise, and in the midst of that noise, you wish that noise would go away, but one day that noise will go away, and your house will be quieter than you remember it. It is a stark contrast. It is also a reminder of some a bit of a sad but yet a good thing. It's that we know our children more when they are adults than we know them when they are children. Because they're only children for 18 years and God willing we should know them longer than that 18 years and we know them more as adults. It's another reminder of that fleeting season. But as we read in our psalm, and of course I have one out of the house, occasionally I'll get this text Hey, uh, when are you going to take care of that for me? Blah, 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 blah. Aren't you old enough to take care of this yourself? Maybe, but uh, could you take care of this for me? When are you going to take care of that for me? Would you like me to stop my entire life and take care of this for you? Yes. (laughs) We are called children of God. And it's a wonderful reminder that as children of God, from time to time, we cry out to God. I asked you to take care of this last week. You don't remember the prayers that I did, and then I did a prayer walk, and then I did this thing. None of you have ever bartered with God, right? God, if you do this thing, then I'll do this thing, and then I'll never do this thing if you just take care of this thing, and it would be really great, and I'll never do that thing again, right? You can't even remember how many barters you've made with God because you've forgotten about them, right? We might have done that when we were children because perhaps we think that's how the relationship should go. That's how we treat one another. Isn't that how that works? You pay Duke Energy money, they give you electricity. You stop paying them money, they cut your electricity off. It's a transactional relationship. We have one of those things. They say that contracts keep good friends because we know where we stand. You do A, B is the result. We have this relationship. It is one of these things that has expectations. It also has results. We're very result-oriented people. Those of you that have played sports at any given time in your life, if you don't have more points than the other team, that's considered a loss. Is it? What if you played your best? What if you did everything that you could? Is it a loss? 
If the Americans didn't win the gold medal, if Steph Curry didn't decide to throw the ball up as high as he possibly could over two people, people would have went, it's a loss. It's a horrible thing. Silver medal, that's a horrible thing. There were players who never played a minute that were the best at what they did. Jason Tatum, the MVP, he just won an NBA championship. You know what he did? He sat the bench. Set the bench. Their team won, and yet, you could argue, he felt what? Like he lost. He didn't really contribute. Matter of fact, he played zero minutes in the last two games. Zero minutes. One of the best players in the world played how many minutes? Zero. Zero. The goals to which we ascribe our lives cloud the ability to be in the moment. One of the fun things about teaching my daughter how to play golf is watching her face when she makes a putt. Equally frustrating are the 77 other times when the ball doesn't go in, but she does everything right and trying to explain to her that the goal isn't to make it in every time because you're just starting. It's not going to go in every time. It's to do the right thing every time, and eventually the ball will do what? She doesn't want to hear it because the ball didn't go in the hole, right? We want, to go, we want to go tap it in. And of course, that's not fair. Aiden's running around hitting the ball seven times, and you're not even counting his strokes. No, because he's not you, and he's different. And why are you paying attention to him when you need to be focused on what you're doing? Then all of a sudden she goes on a row, hits seven putts, and her face lights up, and she's super happy. It's a reminder to me how many times that I've pointed and went, that's not fair. I like using toddler and children analogies in the Psalms because it gets back to primal nature of it's not fair. We have that all the time in our adult world. It's not fair. It's not fair. I'm not playing in my club team championship this week because we lost out on a tiebreaker. And they canceled the week because it rained out and we're not making up that week, so I can't make up the points. We lost on a technical tiebreaker. I'm reading this psalm. You want to know what I'm thinking in my head? That's... We're better than the other team. We just happened to lose by one stroke on a week where I came back from trip and like literally half a str- half a hole over the course of like ha- I'm still digesting. I need to go to therapy for it next week maybe. <laughs> but it's true. I'm preparing for the sermon this week and I'm reading this and I'm like, "Come on, God. Is this fair? This is not fair." But the psalmist hears the same voice that we have. It's not fair. How long? Clearly you've forgotten me because you haven't answered me the way I want. (laughs) How long will you hide your face from me? Because I'm pointed in the wrong direction, perhaps. Perhaps I'm pointed in the wrong direction. Perhaps I'm going this way. God, you're hiding your face from me. Really? How long? How long must I bear the pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? One of the youngins said, this sounds like a personal problem. (laughs) How long shall my enemy be exalted? I need you to do this for me. Forget that everyone else is also your child too. I need you to take care of this child right now. Forget that everybody else is also your child. I need this child to, I need now. Consider and answer me, oh God. Consider, a.k.a. consider here means think about me and no one else for a second, okay? God, I need you to think about me and what I need right now. See the toddler? I love this. Think about me right now for what I need. My God. It's an important thing to remind ourselves that God is our God. This is one of the the coolest parts of this psalm. We're not crying out to just any God. 
There's a horrible quip in my world that the golf gods interact with your ball, and I have to eye roll people and go, remember what I do? I don't. They're really <laughs> God doesn't care about my golf game, I remind people all the time. I show up to the club sometimes in a collar, and they're like, Father, would you ride in the cart with me? <laughs> and I, I have a general saying, and I'm like, just a reminder, God doesn't care about your golf game, God probably cares how you treat each other and how you talk to each other while you're playing golf. And I go, oh, well. sermon for the day is on a Sunday since you decided to play golf instead of coming to church. Other yeah. side. But there is this idea that there are several forces against you, right? The world is against me. These other people are against me. And that's not quite true. We want an explanation of why we're in the hole we're in or why the, this particular thing happens. The golf gods didn't like you. No. My God loves me whether I do well or I don't do well, whether I win or whether I lose, or whether I think I won or whether I think I've lost. Because that's my perspective. Sometimes when a toddler screams and yells in the middle of a grocery store, as my wife shared with me the other day, she commiserated with a, a young mother, and she's like, oh, I've been there. The toddler thinks the world is ending because the particular yellow box that the toddler wanted wasn't what mom wanted to get. The mom wanted the blue box. It was literally over the yellow versus blue box. The blue box was the thing that the child needed. The child wanted the yellow box falling all over the floor. It's a reminder that as parents we make decisions for our children while they are, I'll say under the age of 18, but some of us are still making decisions for our children even after they're 18, but we make decisions for them that's in their best interests. If you're good parents, that's what you do. Even if it causes them discomfort. Right before Aiden left, he tried a very, I will say, brilliant trick. Dad, since we won't see you for many days, we could have ice cream for breakfast, right? <laughs> Good try. No. Falls all over the floor. <laughs> I have cereal for you. OK. Fine. Five minutes later, his world has changed, and now he's on Legos. But the idea is that children know their parents, don't they? When someone else tries to come up to a child and says, I'm your dad, what is that child going to do? No, you're not. My kids know their mom. Because sometimes I'll walk in and I'll go, we're going to do this. That's not what mom said. Well, I'm mom right now. No, you're not. <laughs> Children know their parents. Which is why this line, this admission, it's not just some random person, it's my God. Who knows me and I know God. I also know that God will hear my complaints and hear my prayers. Which is why when my kids ask me for something, it halfway breaks my heart because I'm like, I want to give this to you, but I also have to balance what's in your best interest. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death, a.k.a. please buy me the $500 Lego set at the Lego store. No, we're not doing that. My enemies will say I have prevailed and my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. And this is where it turns, in verse 5. I love that Jesus set the tone because in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember? Look, Dad, Father, God, the person who kind of set this. If there's any way that we could work this out in a different way, that'd be great. If this cup could just, like, pass over me, because the idea of when you were handed the cup, you were handed the cup, basically the idea of you were responsible, you were the leader, you were, you, you were to, to run the show. That's kind of what the cup meant. You were the one in the house who was going to execute, isn't quite the right word here, but to perform the duties. That was your job. 
It'd be really great if the buck didn't stop here, if we're going to use a modern translation, if the buck would just pass to someone else. That would be awesome. Some say Jesus was in his human form. He wasn't quite fully God in this particular moment. It's a reminder that Jesus was always fully God and fully man, which means if God can complain, I'm okay. I can complain. Verse 5, what's the first word? But, <laughs> which means there's something opposite to the complaining. There's something that turns the complaining around. We're, God, you're hiding your face from me. But, the definition of repent means to turn around. This is the turning point in this psalm. There's a turning point. I can cry, I can complain, but I trust, and this is an interesting little word, I say trust because trusted implies that I've done it in the past. How this actually translates is in the same way of God created, it happened in the past, I'm trusting right now, and I'm going to trust in the future. I trust. It's an ongoing relationship. I've done it before. I'm going to do it now. And I'm going to continue to trust in the future. Notice, I don't trust in results. What am I trusting in? Love. I'm trusting in the relationship. I'm not trusting in the score. I'm not trusting in the outcome. I'm not trusting in what I think is a win. I'm trusting in the relationship. That's what happens when you're a parent, when you're a child. You might not understand what's going on in the particular moment, but you trust in their love that out of that love, I'm getting the best I could possibly get out of this person. To flip that another way around, do you think this person's trying to hurt you? And the sad part is some parents fall into that category, which is horrible, because they don't have trust in their parents who love them. That's a cold reality. It's a cold reality of our world, which is why it's hard for some folks to call God Father, because that's not a positive thing for people. They can't pray the Our Father, because every time they hear the word Father, that is not the optimal optimistic view of what they think. And that's a horrible thing. The best part about our God is that we can trust in God's love. That God will love us, whether we've really screwed up, if we're falling on the floor throwing a tantrum in the kitchen, and please don't tell me you, do it as, you don't do this as an adult, because we all do it up here, and we all do it down here, and we mope around. Right? You get into the, you throw the walls up. We all do it. Doesn't matter how old you are. The inner toddler is wide awake. But we trust in the relationship. We trust in the love. And our heart shall rejoice in the salvation. A.K.A. in the end we will be taken care of better than what we thought. Do we know what the outcome is? No. But that's why we trust in the relationship and the love. So I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Every once in a while, I have to remind my children that they have so many toys to play with, it nauseates me. I had a yellow bookshelf. It was with my books. I had a bin of toys. We have to cycle toys out because my kids forget that they own them. We have to put them in front of them so they play with them. And there is a discussion point about, oh, now, when we're starting to think about Christmas. And I'm like, we're not buying these children any more things. They have so many things. I'm glad they do. I use the analogy all the time. They have four different choices of cereal, plus bagels or muffins. And if I make pancakes and waffles, it's like the IHOP at my house. What do you want on the menu? 
We have so much. And if we all take a look at our lives and where we are, I promise you that you have more than just three choices of cereal or one choice of cereal. No one handed you a car. You got to choose the car you drive. You get to choose where you get to go this afternoon. Perhaps you get to choose who serves you your lunch. And off a menu that you can go, I want this, but I don't want it without, I want it with tomatoes, without tomatoes. We have so much. Which kind of brings about the moment where it's about us. And taking a step back reminds us, I will sing to the Lord and be reminded of the many things that are before us. It is a psalm. It is a cry of lament. We have to remember the but. I'm not getting what I want. Things aren't going my way. But is it about me? Yes, we want it to be about us. Yes. And it's okay to say that. And it's okay to say it's not fair. It's also okay to remind ourselves this wonderful thing. Where is it? Verse 1, I can't say it's the most important thing. How long, O Lord? Verse 1 happens because we know God hears us. If we didn't believe that God hears us, verse 1 wouldn't exist. I know that God's going to hear me. I'm asking God, give me a timetable, man. <laughs> Can you hurry it up? Can you let me know when that comes? The confidence to complain shouldn't be overlooked. It means there's a relationship of trust and love. That's why it's kind of funny, but a wonderful reminder that kids don't cry out or tattle to adults that they don't feel are going to come and help them. Do kids cry out to random adults in the, in the grocery store? No. When kids cry out to random adults, that's usually what? It's a problem. Right. That means they don't feel safe. That means they don't feel loved. When they cry out to a random person, that's like flag number 5,000 level. When kids cry out to their parents, it's because they trust, they love their parents, and they want help. It's a sign of a healthy relationship. So this is where I get to tell you it's okay to be a toddler. It's okay to throw a temper tantrum on the floor. It's okay to say it's not fair. But trust in the relationship. Trust in God's love. Trust that God's in charge of the salvation, not you. And it doesn't matter if you can sing or not. The song has to come from within to remind ourselves that we have a God who loves us, who is always with us, even if we're flat on, the, on our backs on the floor doing the turtle thing, kicking up and down. God's still with us. And we'll patiently stand there until we're done. And it usually ends with some kind of embrace or hug. Remember that guy who screwed up and ran down the road and the father came out, ran to meet him, gave him a big hug? Yeah, that part. Let us pray.